Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Norman Bowie, in his essay, A Kantian Approach to Business Ethics, applies the second formulation of the categorical imperative within business settings, showing us how the treatment of workers, and particularly the example of layoffs, uh, can be either in accordance with or against our moral obligations to those people. And Kant's second formulation of the categorical imperative runs act always so, so as to treat humanity whether in the person of yourself or that of others never as a mere means but always as an end so it's a rather complicated uh, formula but it can be reduced down to treating people as ends in themselves not merely as means and this has several correlates that means that we shouldn't reduce people down to say their market value we should uh, respect their human dignity. Even if we think that they're not contributing that much, we shouldn't evaluate them solely in terms of what are, you know, the value added that they bring or anything like that. We have a, a duty to treat them as genuine human beings and to respect their autonomy. And autonomy means a capacity to decide for oneself, among other things. Now, as Bowie is going to point out, um, this, this injunction to not treat people as mere means doesn't rule out any sort of commercial transactions per se. It does place certain limits on the structures of those. He says, no one is used merely as a means in a voluntary economic exchange where both parties benefit. Why? Because it's not so much just on the benefit part, it's the voluntary part. If I can will, willingly choose to enter into a contract or uh, to take on a client or to work with this supplier or to purchase this product, that's respecting my autonomy. If I'm being coerced into it, if I'm being uh, corralled into having only one option or only one decent option, then my autonomy is not being respected. And um, Bowie is going to point out that it's very important to acknowledge and distinguish between negative and positive freedom. So for Kant, negative freedom is going to involve, at the very least, refraining from deception or coercion in how we treat other people. And those are very broad terms that include a lot. He quotes uh, Christine Korsgaard, a great Kantian scholar here, who says, according to the formula of humanity, coercion and deception are the most fundamental forms of wrongdoing to others, the roots of all evil. They violate the conditions of possible assent and all actions which depend on their, that for their nature and efficacy on their coercive or deceptive character are, are ones that others cannot assent to. So if I am coercing you or if I'm depriving you of information that you actually need to make an informed choice, I am not treating you as an end. I'm treating you as a mere means to whatever uh, stockholder uh, returns, my own wish to dominate, pick whatever it is that you like. Um, positive freedom involves permitting or perhaps even fostering the development of human capacities. And this is very important for Kant. Not only our own capacities, but the capacities of others, even if they pass up the opportunity to do so. We, we must act in such a way as to at least allow them the chance to develop their capacities. So he's got a great example here, uh, layoffs of employees. Um, he says, Americans have been deeply concerned about the massive layoffs created by the downsizing 
of corporations in early and mid 1990s. It's still something going on today. Are these layoffs immoral? And he says that a naive Kantian perspective would say, yes, you just simply can't do those. Those are wrong. Why? Because many of the layoffs can be framed in terms of employees being used as a mere means to what? Stockholder uh, returns. You, you lay off employees so that the company will be more profitable. And then, you know, perhaps the company has been purchased uh, by another company. We can think of all the different mergers that have been going on, <clears throat> particularly in the tech sector. Generally, when your company gets purchased, um, especially the further down you are on the, on the scale, that's bad news for you. It's usually really bad news for middle management as well. Um, so, you know, why do they lay off the employees? Because they're, uh, in Britain, they talk about them being made redundant, right? Redundant means you've got more than one thing uh, for the same function. So get rid of all the, you know, trim the fat, as they say. Get rid of all the dead wood is another phrase. If you're doing that, you're treating somebody as fat or as dead wood or as a cost. You're not treating them as a human being. Now, Bowie says, let's go a little bit deeper. That may be the case for some, some cases, uh, you know, uh, situations. There are CEOs who have a reputation for just coming in and gutting companies. Uh, they would be failing by, by that measure. But it could be that you could say, well, listen, when you become an employee, you know that there is the possibility of layoffs. So why are you complaining about that? You've entered into this work relationship voluntarily. Here's where a couple other considerations would come up. So employees could say, in a bad economy, we have to take whatever work we can get. Some people have been out of work for six months, a year. They have to take whatever conditions are going to be offered to them in order to be able to make money and support themselves and perhaps their families. So in that case, could we say that some coercion is going on? Um, Many em employees argue that in times of high unemployment, job insecurity, employees must accept job offers on management terms. Um, so you don't actually accept the threat of a layoff to enhance shareholder wealth freely. You're not saying that it's a fair system, I'm going to enter into it. You're saying it's a rigged system, but I have to do it. So that would be a problem. Another is where you've got a company that has a tradition of a certain kind of bargain uh, where employees are being given job security in exchange for what? Employee loyalty, being asked to do things extra, being asked to contribute to the corporate culture, being asked to, uh, you know, follow through on all the things that otherwise, you know, statistically might, might fall through the cracks. It gives an example such as IBM. At IBM, there, there was such a long tradition of job security in exchange for employee loyal, loyalty. So changing those rules amounted, in, in Bowie's view, to both deception and coercion on the part of management. Um, here we might talk about, well, what would be required in order for layoffs to actually be fair and justifiable under the second formulation? The really key issue is a problem with information asymmetry, which means that management knows what's going on, the employees don't know what's going on. And this applies not just to business organizations, this applies to universities, this applies to government agencies. There's quite often a, a vast information asymmetry. And we can also say that there's uh, information asymmetry on the part of the company in relation to consumers or customers or clients as well. But that goes a little bit further, but it could, it could apply to the same sort of questions. So when there's high information asymmetry, uh, one side has information it keeps from the other side. There is a severe temptation for abuse of power and deception. So a Kantian, Bowie says, would look for ways to reduce the information asymmetry between management and employees. Are there such possibilities? Indeed, there are. Uh, so he talks about open book management. Open book management, uh, under it, he says, all employees are given all the financial information about the company on a regular, frequent basis. 
With complete information and the proper incentive, employees behave responsibly without the necessity of layers of supervision. And this would go a long way towards correcting, he says, the asymmetrical information that manager, managers possess, a situation that promotes abuse of power and deception. So this is, a, a you could say, a means to institutionalize Kant's second uh, formulation of the categorical imperative, not just in re relation to layoffs, but uh, in relation to all sorts of other uh, problematic issues that could arise as well. So this is how Kant's second formulation, at least in terms of the negative freedom, could apply within the workplace.